even if you're going through a fearful situation, God still loves you. Even if you're going through a situation when you've made many mistakes, God still loves you. And he still cares about you. And our fear sometimes wells up within us, well, God's not gonna love me anymore. That's so far from the truth, I can't even begin to preach it to you. Glad to have you. Uh, my name is Zach. If you're our guest today, I'm the pastor here. And today is going to be a great day. We're launching a brand new series. Yes. And it's going to be great. Who here would describe yourself as maybe a little moody and emotional? Raise your hand. Okay, come on. Just raise it up. We know who you are already. It's okay. Some of you are like, I'm not in the mood to raise my hand. That's you. How about this? How many are sitting next to a moody or emotional person? <laughs> yeah. Some of you are so brave. Like, uh... You know, the person next to you is thinking, where can I bury their body? <laughs> now, all of us deal with moods, all of us deal with emotions, and not all of those moods and emotions are wrong, but how many know that sometimes our moods and emotions can just captivate our whole life and take control and, and just like, you know, you start dwelling on it and it consumes you. It's like an all-consuming fire sometimes if you're not careful and you're just, man, I just can't get this out of my head, right, out of my heart and all of these things that happen with our moods and emotions. I don't know if you've noticed this, but over the past probably 20 years, especially I would say the past 10, 5, 10 years, that in our culture, it's been, I want to say pushed, if you will, for us to share our feelings. How many know that that's true? Share your feelings, you know? And, and we just say things like, discover your own truth or whatever. And I'm sure you have all heard of the term mental health. Who has ever heard of the term mental health, okay? Well, a lot of this series is going to deal with some of those issues. But I just want to kind of talk about it just for a second, if we can. Because this push to share your feelings and mental health and that everything is a mental health issue, you, all of your emotions are a mental health issue, you know, if you go by what our culture says. And, and you need to deal with your mental health issues. And I'm not saying we don't have those. And I'm not saying that I'm a doctor. I just play one on TV. Yeah. I'm just saying that these are real issues we do, we do face. And, and how do we deal with those? Here's, here's the difficulty. This push to talk about our feelings and, and basically almost say that you've got a mental health problem, and some people do. I'm not saying that they don't, has become so severe that now the experts are saying that that might be part of the problem. In other words, we're pushing people that they need to go get, you know, uh, help for everything, right? You need therapy for everything in your life, right? And it's become an issue in, in our lives. So much so that in 2020, um, since 2020, the amount of people who go to therapy has doubled in the United States. In 2022, 25% of all Americans have said they have gone to therapy which is um, twice as many as in 2020, which eclipses the 3% of people in the UK who say they have gone to therapy. 25% to 3%. These are, these are amazing numbers in regards to our society. And there's no doubt that fear, anxiety, depression, guilt, and shame, and all these emotions that we have in our life face all of us in some way. All of us deal with these emotions in, some, in one way or another. Isn't that true? Somehow, some way, we all deal with these emotions in one way or another, and they, they affect us at some level. The question is, and this is one I post to you over the next few weeks, is how do we deal with these issues God's way? How do we deal with them God's way? I'm not here to make anybody feel guilty or say that they're wrong or or whatever it is for how you're dealing with your emotions. But what I want to bring to light is how does God's word help us to deal with these things? Because here's the, here's the issue that we have, and you'll see this as we go through our, our talk this morning, is that our mental health and our spiritual health are connected. They're almost inseparable. I think there's a very real aspect to our mental health that's derived from our spiritual health. Are you with me? 
It's, it's a very real thing. And so we're going to talk about this over the next few weeks. And I hope you don't miss a week because we're going to deal with some of the major issues that you've been facing in your life. And today we're starting out with this whole idea, hope wins. And, and let's ask the question, how does hope win? How does, how does it win? Let's look at this verse because here's my prayer in Romans 15. It says, I pray that God, the source of hope, everyone say the source. The source of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So my prayer as we go through this series and today is that the God who's the source of all hope would fill you with hope through the power of his Holy Spirit. Then you would dwell not in fear and anxiety and depression and guilt and shame, but joy and peace would consume your life. Why? Because your, your source is God who's the God of all hope. So that's my prayer. Are, is that a good prayer? And we're gonna believe that's gonna happen in your life today. So the question is, how does hope win? How does hope win? And we're gonna, we're gonna answer it with this today. Hope wins over fear. Hope wins over fear. Now let's be honest, who here has ever been afraid? All right, some of you, may, maybe today's your first time in church in a long time, and you're like, I'm afraid to go to church. Um... I remember years ago when I first started out ministry, I was in charge of a kid's camp. They actually let me take little kids camping. <laughs> Not allowed to do that anymore. And we, we actually stayed in these um, covered wagons, and there was bunk beds in the covered wagons. It was, it was super cool. And so I go to bed, and the, the kids go to bed, and, and they're from anywhere from second to fifth grade, these kids. So in the middle of the night, I hear this bang on the, on the, on the floor of the, the wagon, and I jump out of bed, and you know, my Jason Bourne kung fu mood, like, whoa, what's going on? And so I, I go over, and there's this kid laying on the floor, and I'm like, oh my gosh, he had fallen out of the bunk, and I, and I pick him up, because he's not very big, I pick him up, and he looks at me, he's like, ah! <laughs> and I'm like, are you okay? What's the matter? Is something broken? He's like, ah! And he's looking around, ah! And I'm like, what's going on? He was having night terrors. Remember those? And he, he was still asleep, but he was having night terrors. So I just start slapping him, right? <laughs> I didn't actually do that, but that's why I'm not allowed to work with kids. Anyway, he was having night terrors. I just couldn't get him out of it, right? <laughs> and finally he went back to sleep and, and all was well in the world. But some of you, you have life terrors. Fear has just consumed you in one way or another, and it's just bottled you up. You're like uncertainty about tomorrow. You're fear of what could happen. You got the worst case scenario syndrome. And you're just like, fear, 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 and everything, you know? Maybe even some people don't even like talking to you because all it is is, is just the worst. It's the worst. It's the worst. And that's fear. Well, I want to tell you today that hope wins over fear. And as we think about this this morning, re realize there are some good fears. Like when you go skydiving, you put on a parachute. Why? Because you're afraid to hit the ground without one. That's a good fear. That's a healthy fear. You put on Christ as your Savior because you have a healthy fear of the Lord. So there's good fears. But a lot of fear in our life are really irrational and unwarranted. And they don't need to consume our life. And what you might not know is that fear is actually one of our oldest enemies. Did you know that? It's one of our oldest enemies all the way back from the beginning. And I actually want to read you the story of when fear first walked on the earth, if you will. And it's in Genesis chapter 3. Here's the story. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? 
He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. He was afraid. Fear has been with us all the way since the beginning. Let me ask you this morning, are you afraid? What fear is consuming your life? Some of you are afraid to really commit to following the Lord because you think God's gonna ruin your life. Some of you are afraid because of whatever it is you got, the circumstances in your life. Fear is consuming your life. Adam and Eve were afraid, so they hid from God. We're gonna talk about that today. The question I wanna ask this morning is this, how can hope win over fear? How does it win over fear? And I'm gonna tell you right now, you need to take notes. You need to either pull out the note app on your phone or something. You need to write these down because you're gonna to wanna to review these later. If you have the Church Center app, you can follow along on those notes because uh, we're gonna pull out some things that are straight from Scripture. They're gonna help you overcome fear and you're gonna like, what was that thing that, I'm so afraid. What was that thing that they said? And you're gonna go back and look. And, oh, that's right, because here's what the Word of God says. Are you ready? How does hope win over fear? Number one, hope stops listening to fear and listens to God. Hope stops listening to fear and listens to who? God. God. My beautiful wife, Laura, is over here, back from Japan. Yay! Glad to have her back. She was with Evan and Pam, our missionaries, my son and daughter-in-law, and helping them get settled as they move to Japan. Everything's good in their world. And what you might not know is in Japan, there's a lot of train rides. You got to take a train everywhere just about unless you, you know, have a license or you're crazy enough to drive in a foreign country where you can read none of the language. So a lot of train rides, and so in one particular train ride, she was by herself, and she was heading to another de- destination, and what's interesting, and, and I've not been there, but what's interesting about the culture in Japan is that when you are in a train, almost no one talks. There's no, like, conversation like you and I. They're just it's quiet. So if somebody's talking to someone, everyone notices. So Laura's sitting there, and this guy walks up, and he says, I am from Belgium. He says, I'm from Belgium. And he's wearing a mask, and and if you are uh, an American or a foreigner, you stand out in Japan, especially in this area she was in because everybody else is Japanese. So he goes, hey, I'm from uh, Belgium. Are you you an American? She says, yeah. He goes, somebody stole my wallet. And I need some money to get a hotel for tonight so that I can go uh, get my flight tomorrow. Can you give me some money? And my wife, because I've trained her in the ways of Jason Bourne, She said, no, uh, I don't carry cash, which was a fibberty do. (laughs) But it was a good one, ladies. If a guy approaches you and says, can I have some cash? You say, no, I don't carry cash, okay? You're welcome. I don't know, I don't carry cash. He's like, oh, okay, well, can can you get off at this next exit and come with me to the ATM and give me some money? And she says, no, I can't. And she's starting to get a little uncomfortable, a little fearful, right? And I'm thinking, man, if I was there, I would have Belgium his behind right back to his country. <laughs> anyway, so, so, so he says, he gets mad, and he's finally, he storms off, and he, he, go, he goes off. And she says, I'm not, and then there's this Japanese guy, Japanese lady sitting next to, next to her. And of course, they don't talk, but they're, they're just nodding their head in approval because she <laughs> said, no, you get out of here, Mr. Belgium. You know, what's interesting is, is if we're not careful, fear, if we listen to the wrong things, fear can take us in the wrong direction, right? And it becomes this, almost this irrational reality in our life. And fear is always worse than reality. Because think about this, fear of failure is worse than actual failure. Because if you fail, you get back up and you move forward. Fear of rejection is worse than the actual rejection. Why? Because rejection only lasts for a little while. Fear of embarrassment is worse than embarrassment because embarrassment is only for a moment. Fear is often worse than reality. Why? Because what happens is fear consumes the moment, then it consumes the hour, then it consumes the day, then it consumes the week, then it consumes the month and the year and the decades. And next thing you know, I'm living my whole life in fear. And it becomes this irrational thing that dominates and dominates and dominates. And what happened to Adam and Eve is they started listening to other things that caused fear instead of listening to God. And the enemy says, did God really say, is God really going to care for you? Is God really going to follow through for you? Is God really going to? And they're like, oh, well, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe the fear is right and God is wrong. And then we start listening to this fear. And we, didn't, we let it consume our life. We need to stop believing the lie. Because then God comes on the scene in the garden and he says to Adam and Eve, who told you that? Who's, who said that? Who's, who said you, you, were, you were naked? 
Who said you were ashamed? You should be ashamed. Who said you were this way? And maybe God needs to say that to you today. Who's, who's telling you that kind of garbage? Who's telling you that lie? Who says to you that God doesn't have a purpose? Who's been telling you that God doesn't have a plan for your life? Who's telling you that it's always going to be the worst case scenario? Who's telling you that there's no hope for tomorrow? Who's telling you that, that, that you don't have a future? Who's telling you that God doesn't? I didn't say that. Because hope stops believing the lie and starts listening to God and the truth. Some of you are believing a reality that God never said. Let me say that again. Some of you are believing and living in a reality that God never said or called you to live in. It's one of fear. Who told you that? Isaiah 41 says this, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I'll help you. He says, so we have to listen. He says to you, Don't fear, I'm going to help you. So we have these moments where we're in fearful situations in our life or fearful circumstances or uncertainty about, about tomorrow. What do we do? We listen to the God who says to you, Don't fear, I'm going to help you. And we stop listening to the lie of fear and start believing and listening to God because he's the one who tells us the truth. How does hope win over fear? Write this down, number two. Hope stops hiding in fear and runs to God. It stops hiding in fear and runs to God. Who here is hiding from God? I want to tell a little story about our worship leader, Joel. And when he was, uh, I've known Joel his entire life. Actually, when my son Evan was born, Joel was born about the same time, and they basically grew up together. That's how we know each other. And one time when he was, I'm going to say he was in the third grade or something. He was very little. And the, his family went on a road trip, and they stopped at a truck stop to get some gas and some snacks. And the kids had to all go to the bathroom. And Joel said, no, I don't want to go to the bathroom. So he's waiting in the car. Well, at the last minute, he decides, I'm going to go to the bathroom. So he jumps out of the car at this truck stop, and he runs over into the, the little, the, the big mini mart, you know, like a flying J type thing. And so he, uh, he's in there, and then it's time to go. And then mom and dad get in, the, get in the car. The kids get in the car, and they're like, where's Joel? And dad says, I don't know. I thought he was with you. And she says, I thought he was with you. And where is he? I don't know. And so they look all over the truck stop, no Joel. And all his dad, Mike, could see is truck after truck after truck driving out of the truck stop. And he's like, oh my gosh, my son's gone. And then they look everywhere. They get the workers at the truck stop looking. Everybody's looking, and they get the cop. Finally, the cops come. Like, this is a big deal. They can't, this has been a while. They can't find Joel. And where's Joel? And then they look, and then they, the cops are searching, and then they finally look on the security camera, and they see Joel come into the store, and he hides underneath one of the food racks because he's so terrified and he doesn't know what to do and he's just a little kid and all these people are calling his name and then he, he, he's actually hiding from the people who can help him. Isn't that amazing? And finally his dad, Mike, is like, Joel, you're 18, come out from underneath the <laughs> Here's the problem. We oftentimes, we hide from God because we don't think he can help. When Adam and Eve heard God walking through the garden in the cool of the day, what'd they do? They, they hid from him. That's what fear does. Fear causes us to hide from the one who can truly actually help us. The one who actually can help us in our time of need. Fear doesn't ever help you in your time of need. But God does. But God does. See, hope stops hiding in fear and runs to God. Psalms 34 says this, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. It doesn't say I ran from the Lord and he answered. No, I sought the Lord. I actually pursued him and what? I found him and he delivered me from all my fears. He helped me in my time. I was afraid, but when I sought the Lord, the closer you walk with Jesus, the less you will live in fear. The closer you walk with Jesus, the less you will live in fear because the closer I am to him, the more he casts out fear from my life. And we don't hide from the one who can actually help us. We actually pursue him even more than ever before. How do I, how does hope win over fear? Write this down. Hope stops living in fear because God's love drives it out. Look how quickly Adam and Eve forgot the love of God. I want you to try and wrap your mind around this for a second. Adam and Eve lived in the garden. It's called the Garden of Eden, and it was perfect. They had everything. It was irrational for them to sin and eat the fruit that God told them not to eat. It doesn't make any sense. And, and think prior to that, that 
Every day, God would come down in the cool of the day and walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. The Almighty, okay? The God of all peace and all comfort and all joy. In his presence, the Bible says, is fullness of joy. And he would walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. They knew about the loving God. They knew how loving and caring he was. And then the moment sin and fear got in their life, they forgot how much God loved them. They forgot. And they began to live their life in fear. And God calls out to them, hey, where are you at? Where'd you, where'd you guys go? And I believe that when God called them and he says, hey, Adam and Eve, where are you? I think there was a lot of love in that tone. I don't think it was God saying, where are you? I think it was God saying, where, where are you guys at? I came down here to be with you. I wanted, I wanted to spend time with you. Where'd, you. where'd you go? I thought we were living together. I thought we were having life together. And yet they were hiding in the bushes living in fear. They had forgotten about how much God loves them. Have you forgotten how much God loves you? How much he cares for you? You know, God didn't send a heart emoji on your cell phone to, to, to remind you how much he loves you. Think about that for a second. So for some of you, that's, that's the pinnacle of your affection, heart emoji smoochy kissy face emoji right they have the, the one like this I can't even do it my thumb, my thumb's too crooked but God sent Jesus to show us how much he loves us right and, and when Jesus stretched his hands out on the cross he was literally saying I, I love you this much I, I'm, ta- I'm, I'm laying my life down for you you see fear always tries to keep you from remembering how much God really loves you even if you're going through a fearful situation, God still loves you. Even if you're going through a situation when you've made many mistakes, God still loves you. And he still cares about you. And our fear sometimes wells up within us, well, God's not gonna love me anymore. That's so far from the truth, I can't even begin to preach it to you. Because if that was the case, God would have never sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. It's his perfect love. In fact, John says this. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. It has no place in our life because we belong to the Almighty. We belong to the Lord. In fact, uh, once Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, God sent his Holy Spirit. And when Jesus is your Lord, there is no fear. Uh, fear has no place in your life. 2 Timothy 1 says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power and love and self-discipline. Another translation says, and a sound mind. There's your mental health. Power, love, and a sound mind. Everyone say sound mind. So it's not a spirit of fear that God gives us, but it's a spirit of power, love, and a self-discipline. I discipline my mind. I discipline my emotions, what? To rely on the Holy Spirit to give me peace and joy in times that are fearful. To say, God has not given me a place and a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. My friend Mark, you guys know Pastor Mark, he's been here many times, and he was once on a mission trip to Africa when he was working for a, a television network, and he was down there working, and he calls up his wife and daughters one night, and he says, okay, I'm going to go to bed, love you guys, um, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Hangs up the phone, he goes to lay down, turns out the light, and he says that he just had this overwhelming sense of fear, this pit in his stomach, and he began to think that someone was going to murder his wife and his two little girls. He said the, the, the feeling was so overpowering. He goes, I just like was so afraid. He goes, I immediately called back on the phone. I'm like, are you guys okay? I just, this crazy weird feeling. And his wife's like, no, we're fine. We're just chilling out, you know, watching movies. And okay, okay, okay. Hangs up the phone. He goes back to bed and he says, he lays there. Next thing you know, this whole overwhelming sensation of fear comes over him again. Someone's gonna murder my wife and two kids. He goes, this is crazy. He picks up the phone again. He goes, honey, are you okay? What's going on? Are you good? He goes, we're fine, honey, what's the matter? And his wife, Debbie, says, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. He goes, I don't know. He goes, I just had the overwhelming feeling of fear in my life. He goes, that somebody's gonna come into the house and murder you guys. And she goes, honey, that's a spirit of fear and that's not from God. Let's pray right now. And they began to pray for the peace of God. You know why? Because God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power and love and self-discipline, a sound mind. 
See, a sound mind doesn't trust in human effort. It trusts in the Spirit of God who gives me peace in fearful times. He says, listen, listen, some of you are afraid of things that are so irrational, like you're having a feeling, somebody's going to murder my wife and kids. That's so irrational. But I know that the enemy can use those tools in our life to kind of captivate your mind and captivate your heart and say, you know what, you need to live in this fear and you need to act on this fear. You say, no, no, no. The spirit God gave me is not one of fear, but of, of, of love and of power and a sound mind. Stop giving in to the enemy. He has no place in your life. Fear is not from God. Fear and love cannot abide in the same house. And when you're full of the Holy Spirit, fear has no place there. How can hope win over fear? Write this down. Hope stops looking back and starts moving forward in faith. Hope stops looking back and starts moving forward in faith. Think about this for a second. You have just made the mistake of all mistakes. You ate from the tree God told you not to eat from. All of you have eaten from that tree because we're all sinners. And God comes down and you run. You're like, peace, I'm out of here. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to run from the Almighty? The Bible says, if even I go down to the depths, you are there. Where are you going to go? So here, Adam and Eve hiding in the trees. And God's like, hey, where are you? God knows where they're at. It's like an adult playing hide and seek with the kid who's hiding right there. And you're like, where are you? But God's not joking around. Adam and Eve had to come out of the trees at some point. Adam and Eve had to stop living in hiding at some point. Adam and Eve had to decide, I'm going to move out of this life and, and, and move out of this Past, They could have said, oh, I've made the worst mistake. Oh, I have this guilt and shame. Oh, I've got fig leaves covering my body. Oh, man, I can't face God. They could have done all these excuses. But at some point, they had to say, you know what? We're going to make a step forward out of these trees, and we're going to move towards God. Because fear says you need to keep living in your past. You need to keep living in the bondage. And God says, no, that's not where where I have for you. What I want you to do is I want you to start moving forward into the plan and the life that I've called you to live and it's a good plan and it's a good life and it's not full of fear but full of hope some of your anxiety you just can't even control it it's so bad listen that's not from the Lord God brings peace Adam and Eve had to come out of the trees at some point and at some point you have to come out of the trees too Isaiah says this, as those who trust in the Lord will find new strength, they will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. See, that's what happens when we start walking towards what God has for us and the plan that he has for us. See, Adam and Eve, though they failed, they got up. They stopped listening to fear. They stopped hiding from God. They stopped living in fear and started living in the love of God. And they stopped looking back and started moving forward to all God has for them. Philippians says this, I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I forget the past and I look forward. Some of you, your past has got you so bottled up, you can't even move forward. Stop letting it rule your life. It's time to move forward. It's time to really trust in the God who has a good plan for your life. Some of you are going through things right now. You think, man, maybe this is the end. It's not the end. The best is yet to come. What if Adam and Eve just stayed in in the jungle? How much they would have missed out on. What are you missing out on? Because fear has dominated your life and captivated your life you might be going through some scary situations some uncertainty in your life but listen there is a peace that comes from God that passes all understanding that comes in our our most fearful times and God says listen never will I leave you and never will I forsake you I'm going to walk through this with you and I just want you to know that on the other side there's goodness is not one of fear but a power love a sound mind let me pray for you
Maybe you're here today and you've been living in fear. Maybe you have been afraid to trust in God as your Savior. Maybe you've been in a situation where you're just like, man, I don't know what's going to happen. My fear of today has just consumed my tomorrow. I want to pray for you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity first. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus and you'd like to today, you can just lift your hand and say, yeah, that's me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. We're going to pray. Maybe you're here today and you want to trust in him for the first time. Is there anybody here that would like to do that? Yeah, anybody else? Surrender your life to Jesus today. Maybe today you have been living in, in fear. Fear has been consuming your life. It's time to win the victory. I want to pray for you. I just want you to raise your hand right now. Say, that's me. Yep, lots of hands. Hold it up. Hold it up. Just, just this, is, this is to the Lord. You're holding that fear up to God right now. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of embarrassment, fear, 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 fear. God, we just come to you right now and we surrender our fears to you. Lord, because we know that that's not the spirit you gave us. You gave us your Holy Spirit. It's one of love and joy, sound mind, one of peace and grace. Lord, I pray that these people who have their hands up, Lord, you see them, that you would break the spirit of fear in their life. Lord, the things that they're so intimidated by and they're so afraid of, God, I pray that you would just help them to walk out of this place in complete victory in the name of Jesus Christ. And God, they would continue, Lord, to walk in that victory every day of their life, Lord, not giving in to fear, but Lord, moving forward in you. Lord, the life that you have, a rich, full, and satisfying life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.